we are in an organ shortage crisis. Thousands of people worldwide are on transplant lists and many die waiting. But three decades ago, scientists predicted a world where instead of waiting, we could order organs on demand. I'm talking about bioprinting, the exciting future of 3D printing technology. A patient can go into a hospital and then ask them to print me an organ. We'd be able to make it viable for patients to live off that. Could save a lot of lives. A lot of the uh, chronic disease today can be solved. Full disclosure though, I do have a bit of family history of heart disease. And it's always at the back of my mind that I might one day have to deal with it. But what if, as scientists predicted, I could at some point just print myself a brand new heart? That would be something, wouldn't it? But exactly how close are we? I know what you're thinking. What does this guy know about the future? That's the thing, I'm no expert. Oh boy, I feel like I'm giving birth to aliens. Three, two, one. Oh, there you go, right there. Wow. Digital resurrection. Digital biomarkers. Tissue engineering. GM manipulations. Organology. If all these buzzwords are supposed to change the way we live forever, I want to be in on that conversation to find out exactly what's the big deal about 3D bioprinting. Full disclosure, I have never seen a 3D printer in my life. And I always thought you had to go to some industrial warehouse to catch one, right? But guess what? Here I am at Tampanese Regional Library for a 3D printing workshop. <laughs> Hakim Tio is one of the library's resident 3D printing experts. His team has conducted workshops since 2018, bringing a seemingly inaccessible technology to people like me. So I'm seeing 3D printing a vase over here. How long would something like this take? So this would take about three to four hours. Why would someone 3D print a vase where I could buy one in just a few minutes? Well, actually, with 3D printers, you can actually personalise and customise your 3D creator items. So that actually brings me to something that the producer mentioned, that you have some uh, wireless earphones that um, your dog ate the cover, I believe. What? Why are my producers telling you these things? She's a bit naughty. Mm -hmm. So she decided one day, it might be a good idea for her to chew off oh, no. the lid of my wireless earphones here. Oh, that's a lot of damage, yeah. Well, not to worry, Rishi. We can actually have a solution for you, printed right here. Whoa, look at that. Yeah. That is wild, bro. Printing starts with a spool of plastic filament, which is fed into a heating element and melted. The melted plastic, serving as the printed ink, is then deposited on a platform in a layer-by-layer -layer fashion. In less than half an hour... There you go. All right. Ta-da! This is unreal, bro. Yeah. We, like, just... We just designed this. So, yeah, there you go. What? Enjoy. What other applications does 3D printing have? that can push the envelope or the boundaries in the future. There are a lot of industries that are ad adopting that uh, 3D printing right now. Most notably of all, uh, medical, uh, healthcare. It's actually doing 3D bioprinting. Instead of using plastic, you can actually use living cells to create fully grown human organs. Imagine if you have organ failure, right? And you go see a doctor. And then ask them to print me an organ. Or any tissue that you want and replace that with the ones that you have which are damaged. So it's personalised. So back in 2004, 10-year-old Luke Masella became the first recipient of a 3D printed human bladder. He had a dysfunctional defective bladder, but after receiving these 3D printed bladder implants, he was able to pass urine perfectly. And that got me thinking, if nearly 20 years ago they were able to print a human bladder, then I know what I want today. 
I want a new heart, a new 3D printed heart. And I know just who to go to for my heartfelt request, Professor Yong Wai Yi. She is one of the leading experts in the field of 3D bioprinting, having co-authored a 270-page textbook about it. Prof, I'm here because I want to print a 3D heart. Can you do that for me? Well, that's the grand vision, but so bad we are not able to print that for you. Huh? Why? I read that there was someone who had a 3D printed bladder mm. about two decades ago and he's still using it. Yep. Why can't we use that same technology for the heart? The bladder is a simpler structure than the heart. The heart is a solid organ that contains many different types of tissues. For example, the muscle cell, the blood vessel cell, the heart valve. And inside the heart, it actually contains a lot more microstructure in order for the whole heart to function. Different types of tissues and cell types, it will require different types of bio inks in order for the cell to survive and grow well and then ultimately function as the intended organ. Now, one of the key challenges is designing the material property of the bio ink. Bio ink. That's the material that will be needed to print my heart. It is composed mostly of living cells. Try out this strange of liquid material, then you can try to trace it according to this pattern. Oh, it's already dripping out. I feel like I'm giving birth to aliens in your lab. So you are not able to control the thickness. Because the viscosity is very low, the material just flows away. Professor Yong then gives me a second syringe, which contains a more viscous bio ink. It's thicker and more gel-like. Oh, there you go. A higher viscosity material, we can get good shape control. But as you imagine, if you can put cells into the bio ink, mm. and we squeeze it out like that, all the cells inside might experience some sort of a damages because oh, of very high stress experienced by the cells. So it's always very conflicting. We want material that is very liquid so that the cell will survive inside, can breathe inside, can grow inside. But yet soft material doesn't give us the type of control for shape, right? Because it will just flow away. Ah. So how long before we can actually 3D print a human heart? This probably will take more than 30 years to achieve. I was a little disappointed that you can't just print a 3D heart yet. It looks like we're going to have to wait at least 30 years before something like that happens. But like Prof Yong said, scientists all over the world are looking for solutions to help us out. And when she says all over, I think she means we got to think further. We need to think outer space. You see, when we 3D print tissues, living cells are being forced through the printer's tiny nozzle. Not unlike this basketball that has to go through the narrow side of that net. But with way more pressure. You see, cells are sensitive to such pressure. So in order to keep them alive and to make it easy for them to flow through the nozzle, the ink that we use for bioprinting cannot be too thick. Not as thin as water, but thinner than honey. So imagine trying to print a 3D organ like the heart with such a watery substance. As the printer tries to print this layer by layer, there just won't be any structural integrity. And the bio ink will simply collapse under its own weight. So I guess it's bye-bye to my 3D printed heart. It's a problem that's plagued scientists for years, and some have decided to look for answers in the stars. I'm talking about printing organs in space.
400 kilometers away from our planet is the International Space Station, where NASA astronauts are trying to 3D bioprint human tissues and organs. I'm speaking to one of the men behind these 3D printers in space today. And at the very heart of that goal is his daughter. She was born with a hole in her diaphragm, and so she was given a 10% chance of survival, and she did survive, but she survived with one lung. It sort of became a personal goal of mine to grow her lung. Uh, that was turned out to be much more ambitious than I thought it was. So help me understand this. How did your quest to grow a lung turn into this mission to be able to print organs in space? Right now on Earth, if I'm going to grow a heart, I have to make a structure. It's, some, it's a scaffold. But when you can make a scaffold and put the cells inside that, rigid structures that are inhibiting those cells from moving. To keep cells alive, cells must communicate. The cells must move. The cells must be in an environment that they like very much. So, to print a heart using a fluid bio-ink, we would require a scaffold or a structure to hold it together. But this very scaffold could also be killing off the cells. That's because the scaffold restricts the cells from moving around freely and they may die as a result. But in outer space, where there isn't gravity that would cause the structure of a heart to collapse, these cells don't need scaffolds. They can be bioprinted into tissues and organs directly. In space, the hope is, as I print, it holds shape. Now it can continue to take that time to grow and, and maintain its shape. So Kenneth, we're saying that it is this zero gravity in space that allows the cells to float in place and not collapse into a puddle. How far are we from this becoming a reality, you know, printing organs in space? This is a money issue, very frankly. There's a lot of interest, but there is a limited amount of money right now. So for now, still no heart. Not even in space. But there is one organ that I might be able to replace. Down on Earth, and right here in Singapore. And that is the largest organ in the human body, your skin. In 2006, Tan Ming Jie was fresh out of school, working as a lab assistant. His job wasn't something that many of us can stomach, killing days old mice and harvesting their skin for use in drug testing experiments. It is estimated that more than 115 million animals are used or killed in lab experiments every year. What's worse, 96% of all drugs that are shown to be safe and effective in animal tests go on to fail in human trials. These appalling statistics drove Ming Jie to find viable alternatives. And eight years on, it seems like he's made some headway. Okay, before we start out for science, touch my hand. Okay, it's not what I expected, but sure. Have hey. a feel. Nice, good hands. Okay, now I want you to feel this. This is a 3D bioprinted skin. Wow. Now I understand why you asked me to touch you when I came in. I've got to say, it feels pretty close. Human skin contains at least two layers. The epidermis, which is the top, and the dermis, which is the bottom. So here, this in vitro skin model, we also have these two layers. Is it live? This is alive. So it is functioning like a human skin. So we can use it for numerous applications, like penetration tests. Nowadays, skincare product uses a lot of new advanced technology to get ingredients into the skin more. Using in vitro skin as a model, we can evaluate the quantity of the ingredient that has went through. Because skincare product contains harmful things as well. Whatever penetrates into the skin, into your bloodstream, they will travel to other organs. It can be the liver, it can be the heart. Eventually, our dream is to bioprint the function of liver and heart into a miniature platform, create organology. 
An organ on a chip is a miniaturized electronic biological device that mimics certain organ function. For Ming Jie, it would allow him to test how skincare products affect the liver function, for example, without needing to recreate an entire liver. We're also trying to come up with different in vitro skin model using different ethnicity, Chinese, Malay, and Indians. So it's like a multi-racial skin lab in here. If you're someone who uses skincare products, you know that what's stated on the label may not always be true for your skin. But with the 3D printed skin models, it means that they can test with a fairly better degree of accuracy now, you know. So you could be testing these products on an Indian male skin with uh, sensitive skin, living in such climates perhaps. But 3D bioprinting could do even more than just product testing. It could potentially cure a disease that was previously incurable. It's been a day since I did an MRI scan of my knee. So Doc, I understand you've got some results for me. Yes, I do. Right. So this, this is your knee. <laughs> Wait, this is my my knee? Yes, this is a 3D print of exactly your knee that we printed from your MRI. This shows us your cartilage, mm -hmm. which is mapped via the colour. Orange colour uh, means it's about 1mm of thickness. Okay. Green colour means it's about 2mm of thickness. What's the meaning of uh, the thickness of cartilage? How is it relevant to my knee health? So, as uh, we age, our cartilage becomes a little bit thinner. Mm -hmm. yeah, if it becomes too thin, then you will experience uh, knee pain. I do feel a bit of strain and pain when I exert my knee sometimes. Structurally, your knee has good amount of cartilage, maybe just a bit of cartilage thinning over the top part of your knee, so I wouldn't be too worried. Ah, so conventional 3D printing, which uses plastic as the ink, isn't just for vases and earbud covers. I can see now how it can also be useful in a medical setting to help patients understand their conditions better. It's also good for surgical planning. So for example, this is a patient's also knee. She has a fracture, see this blue colour portion. So I would use this to plan how I'm going to reconstruct it or fix it, where I'm going to put my metal plates and screws so I can perform this surgery better. So I'm relieved to know that my cartilage is in normal condition according to the thickness that the MRI scans and the 3D models have shown. Just when I thought it couldn't get any better, I hear that a biotech firm is elevating the technology even further. Which is why, in true TV superhero fashion, I've made a beeline for South Korea. Because this company claims that it can dramatically reduce knee pain caused by cartilage thinning. This knee is modelled after a scan of a patient with osteoarthritis, a condition where cartilage wears out. According to the scar, that or just some thickness and the shape, everything can be automatically calculated from the AI. So first, we take a picture using AI program and then send this picture to our machine. So I put in there. Mm -hmm. And then I push the bio ink. Right now, almost the printing is uh, complete. Mm, mm, mm. You can see yellow material. You're saying that you can 3D print a new cartilage for me? No. I just produced the cartilage regeneration patch, and that 
main function is invite the stem cell to regenerate cartridge. We interrupt this program for a quick biology lesson. Starring me. What? I've, I've got to do this part as well. Okay, well, just for you. Think of stem cells as your body's shapeshifters. Given the right signals and environment, these stem cells can shapeshift or differentiate into many other types of cells. Muscle cells. Nerve cells. Blood cells. And of course, the cells that make up cartilage, chondrocytes. The theory is that when stem cells are applied to damaged or faulty tissue, they can change into a healthy version of the damaged tissue, effectively regenerating them. And because most treatments use your own stem cells, there is a low chance of immune rejection. After completion of printing, doctor operate and open up the, some cartridge area mm -hmm. and detach the regeneration patch and put into the car using some biological glue they attach there. For the last 100 years, we produced one drug for million people, but this operation only for you. So it's like a tailor-made process. Exactly. It seems like the world of 3D printing is trying to do some quite remarkable things for humanity. Is it successful? Well, I can't really print out a new heart if I needed one. But you can print out organ tissue, and that's helping to reduce things like animal testing, for instance. And that's really what's quite exciting to me about this world of 3D printing. It's almost like a democratic process, which is putting the power in the hands of anyone really. You could be a scientist, a doctor, an astronaut, or you could even be a clueless comedian like me. And it seems like the limits of this technology are quite boundless. But what does that mean for me today? Well, it just means that uh, my damaged wireless earphones now have a new home.